We have another presentation, a brief but sweet presentation by Jim Drew. Yay! Jim, go ahead. Hello, everybody. Yay! I'm back. He's back. He's front. Uh, I'd like to thank my wife for letting me come again. And, uh, Yay! I thank her. Uh, I'll make it real short. Uh, last year I was showing you guys a supercar pro board I was kind of tinkering with. And uh, they're actually in production finally. And I was supposed to have them for the show, but I didn't. But I'll have them not long after the show. And as a result, um, I've been showing some stuff here. Um, we've been doing backups of discs and things like that. Um, it's a low-level, flux-level copier program, somewhere similar to what Cryoflux is, but it's a little different resolution, a little higher resolution. Uh, but a neat thing about it is I've hooked up with a gentleman by the name of Michael Johnson, hmm. and he, he has a website you guys can check out. It's called FPGA Arcade. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so he's the maker of the FPGA mm -hmm. Arcade board, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I've worked a deal with Mike that um, all the disk image formats that we're going to use are going to be generated with SuperCard. So we'll have real low-level flux disk images for the Amiga, uh, for Atari ST, for Commodore 64, any kind of the cores that are going to go on this FPGA arcade emulation system. So you'll be able to play like Shadow of the Beast on the FPGA arcade as it is a real disk. Oh, So read and write functions. So I'm also now officially the U.S. distributor for the FPGA arcade. Oh, wow, congratulations. And so we'll be able to get them from me directly. I'm going to launch my website when we get back down. <laughs> I have to now. Wait a minute. Is, yeah. is, is that still at cbmstuff.com? Because, yep. because yep. I check it and I say, it's not yeah. working. It's Actually, not working. Darn, darn, darn. I put it up periodically for testing. Oh, for testing. Yeah. Okay. But I need to put it up now because Michael's sending me some of the uh, information okay. about the, the boards themselves. I don't actually have one here because Mike's finishing the rest of the firmware, but he's getting ready to ship them all out as well. So I build the order them directly from me. Hmm. If you've already have an order in with Mike, get through Mike because that's our arrangement. Um, but some people have done that. Um, they're kind of pricey, but uh, if you take a look at this FPGA, what it is, it's a, it's a whopping huge FPGA on this thing. Oh. And it has a USB interface um, with a Vencom um, FTDI um, serial port interface, and it's got an expansion port, and there's going to be an 060 daughter cord, uh, card for it that he's making, um, and a whole bunch of oh. other things. So oh. the FPGA has got um, 32 megs on board. Uh, with the, with RAM on the board, and it's got um, either S video output or it has VGA output. You can get it with an S video option. It always has VGA, but you can get an S video if you need to. And retail price in the U.S. with the S VGA option is two ninety nine. So it's kind of pricey in a way, but it also has the ability to run real arcade machine games because that's one of the things that Mike's really into. It's like he has cores for Pac Man and Donkey Kong and all that, and it's identical to the original arcade. It's not like like a sort of pseudo clone you'd have. It's the actual um, ROM code from the original machine encoded as an FPGA device. So that's kind of like what I've done you know, in the last few months or so with Commodore stuff. I've been really, really busy over the last year. Um, I had a little bit of a window to work on SuperCard, uh, but the chip manufacturer, which is FTDI that I use, they had a chip that was recalled, and it was a chip that I'm using. So it actually solved a lot of mysteries why I was having some issues with the USB transfers and it was a bug in the chip. So in the interim, I thought, you know, they're going to release a fix really quick and I'll be okay. And it took eight months for them to release a, a fix for it. So that was kind of a hold up because I just had a lot of opportunity to finish it at the time, but kind of picked up other contracts. And so now I'm a little bit more busy because um, last time I was here, I was the CEO of my company and now oh. I own the company. Oh, yeah. so partner got kicked out, and so okay. yeah, it was not quite sure the difference. Hostile, okay, hostile takeover by yourself, a hostile takeover of yourself, or no, no, I had partner. Oh, no. you did? Oh, yeah, I yeah, didn't it was know a that. Yeah, it was a big company, so we had to we had to part our ways. And so that's I've been really busy with that transition and doing products for it, and you know, ramping that up and fixing a lot of problems that we had for two years of partnership. So that's where I've been doing. So, anyways, yes. When will each of those respective products be available? Your SuperCard and the SuperCard Super Pro? Pro, I would say probably in yeah, it's the next month or so because oh, they're good. they're in production. Actually, I changed the SuperCard Pro too. Last year we were here, it was just a copier. Now uh, it also has the ability to be what's called you know I've heard of uh, HXC, which is a floppy drive emulator. Uh, yes, um, yes, yes. So I added a, a SD okay, media yeah. card to SuperCard Pro. It actually stores images on it, 
And so you could take this and put it in your like Amiga 1200, pull your, uh, your drive out, and it becomes your floppy drive for the 1200. And you can load protected images, exactly like the original disk. So awesome. it's powered up by the 1200's power supply. Will you have like a screen and buttons to interface that? There are two. The nice thing about SuperCard is it's all built by itself. You don't need a USB interface really. It supports it. It has two serial ports. So you can run it with a microcontroller. You can drive it with a Commodore 64 or a Timex St. Clair. Whatever you want to drive it with, literally. You can talk back and forth to it. So you can have an interface with like... Uh, have you ever seen those little LCD displays that got little push buttons with them? And mm -hmm. they've got serial port built into it? Right. I actually have one. I should have brought it with me. I was going to, but the room size was uh, a little bit smaller. <laughs> and it's a stack drive arrangement. And I used one of those for my SuperCard. So I could say drive A, drive B, start, go, you know, stop, what track you want to be on. So it can communicate directly to the board. Same thing with like the 1200. We can run the serial port right into um, like one of the VIA or the CIA and bit bang it if you wanted to. Or a real serial port, however you want to do it. Same thing with the FPGA Arcade. We can actually run data lines directly into it. Now, the other function I wanted to do with this is that it's a really super fast CPU on my SuperCard, so we can do 1541 drive emulation like a 1541U2 at low level. Oh. And one of the things I did since I did a bi-directional port on it where you can read or write off of this, um, if you're not using it with a floppy drive, you can actually plug a parallel cable into it into your 64, and actually it's a parallel port because the VIA axis is right on there. So it simulates a parallel port as well. Oh. So that's pretty nifty. So that's the three different things it does now. Instead of just being a copy, it does all these other things. How big is this item, uh, the Supercar Pro? Is it internal or external? It's huge. That's it. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, you can put it inside of uh, your Amiga 1200 or really oh, easy okay. or any of your stuff. Um, in fact, actually, um, typically what you do is you put in, like a drive enclosure. Like John's got a drive enclosure over there. Yeah. It fits inside the drive enclosure. So you you can sneak a USB cable out if you want to plug it into your PC or Mac. There's PC, Mac, and Unix support, or Linux support, uh, through the FTDI chip. And I'm making all the software open source for it. So it's all written in uh, Visual Basic, so it's really easy to understand. Basically, the way the SuperCard works, it, it's packet-based. So you tell it the command, like read this track, write this track, you know, dump this to the buffer, convert this to GCR, or whatever. So I wanted to try to do as much processing on here as possible. And then, of course, you can get raw data back. So if you want to do your own processing, you can do that as well. Any chance of being able to use that with like when UAE with like a real Amiga drive or something to where you yeah. could? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so wants, yeah absolutely. Yeah, it'll support a real Amiga drive. You can plug a 34 pin, um, you know, could you could access drive. it with the emulator? If you write some kind of an interface, either from serial or from USB, sure. Like okay. from when UAE, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then the other question when will you have the FPG arcades? As design? soon as Mike sends them, um, He's finishing up the software or the firmware for it. I don't know. I don't know for sure. Okay. Um, he claims in the next, you know, month or so. How many? Oh, cores? and then what's the price on that? Uh, Ninety-nine dollars. Okay. Receiver card. Can I just give you money now? Like I'm very <laughs> no, excited no, about all of this. No, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have to know how many cores exist for FPGA? Or FPGA arcade. Arcade, yeah. I do not know. Uh, there's a ton. If you go to FPGArcade.com, yes, he has a ton of cores right yes, now. I see. And what's funny about this whole thing, Mike's big interest is Atari ST. Uh, There's uh -huh. not a core for it yet. That was his whole uh -huh. reason to make this. And then apparently everyone beat him on the head with Mini Mig <laughs> and all that. So and I'm working with Mike uh, to fix some things like Paula, which is the disk drive controller. I mean, I wrote and designed hardware for Commodore Amiga stuff, you know, SuperCard Pro or SuperCard Amy, Amy 2, Amy 3, all these things I did. So I had to reverse engineer Paula a lot. And, oh, it works. and so you look at the mini make core and what uh, Michael knew, and there's a lot of stuff that was just assumptions that were not even close to being right. And so they had nobody had an idea of how to do the GCR uh, data separator that's built into Paula, which I spent a lot of time because everybody knows I did Mac emulation, and so that's GCR is what the Mac uses. So I had to learn that completely. So I'm helping with that project. I'm not a, a VHDL guy. Um, Verilog stuff I've done in the past, so I worked a little bit with 1541.2 to um, write some code for it, so I learned a little bit there. Wow. So I'll be helping Mike a little bit and some stuff, so whatever I can help out in that way I'll, I'll do. But my focus is on um, this basically, getting this interface and a lot of different things and making this as usable for everybody like you're saying, like Win UAE or whatever. All the information is going to be readily available to anybody, so literally you can say, uh, well one thing I've got here that's kind of cool, is i got a, a dump, a, um, CBM GCR function, so you can say dump disk, and it just goes and it dumps the whole thing as a, as a um, 
D64. Will, will okay. you have documentation online or as a PDF uh, for us to read on how to use yeah, Supercard be a, Pro? Yeah, there's a full dev kit as well, besides having regular documentation for the average person. So that'll be nifty. Um, any questions on this at all? Um, uh, other things I did is why I was here, I installed quite a few what I called an Ultra 64 oh, reset. I have some more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, basically, was I made this, and I've got them there. Anybody who brought their SX with them, oh, I'll no, give you one. So we're there. Okay. You can have them. I'll give them to you. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a reset device. A lot of people, especially nowadays, not back in the day so much, but nowadays, we don't like drilling holes in our stuff. Uh, yeah. um, so I wanted to have a really easy way to reset the SX64 without having a cartridge in because uh, I don't use cartridges typically in my computers. Uh, I do sometimes in the 15, or the, the 128 with uh, 1541U2, I use it in that. But I don't like having stuff put in there because typically, like when I'm working with copy protection stuff, most games look for cartridges, they look for parallel ports, they look for extra RAM in the drive, they look for different things. So I have to have a, basically a virgin system to test with. Mm. So with the SX64, it's a great test machine because you can take it with you to your buddy's house who's having a problem and you can look at it. But you gotta turn on and off it constantly to reset it. So I went ahead and made it so that the reset button on the inside cover that pops out, you can press and hold that for two seconds, let go of it, and it resets the computer. And I thought, well, I gotta be using a microcontroller to do this, so I might as well make it do other things as well. So if you press and hold it for five seconds, it switches drive numbers between eight and nine. And if you press and hold it for eight seconds, or the screen will actually shift by itself to let you know it's resetting, it'll swap between two ROM sets. So for my case, it's ideal because a lot of programs don't work with Jiffy DOS. Then I have to go back to the old ROM set. And so if I could press and hold it and I wait and switch back to regular ROM set, now I can test the program see if it works. So it's a little device I made. It literally takes it's five wires if you want all the features. It's four wires if you want standard features. Um, you remove a screw. You put it in place. You tighten the screw. That's the ground plane for it. You solder a power wire. You solder the, um, the little jumper trace we use cut for drive eight, drive nine. And then um, you unplug one wire and you actually slip the wire inside of it to plug. You push it back down in place. So instead of having to solder that one. And then there's one for the reset, which is um, basically on the back of the 1541 plugs or the serial plugs, IEC they call them. There's a center pin, which is a big old pin that comes out. Really easy to get to, Just, that's your reset line. So it's really easy to install, and it's really easy to use. So anybody who brought an SX here, I will yes. give you one. I did not bring the PDF here to give to you to tell you how to install it. <laughs> so I am forced to put up cbmstuff.com. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yay. Just so we can have a download of that. <laughs> very good, very good. So if you want one, uh, come see me. I brought uh, a bunch of them here, and I have some wires for them as well. They're all pre-cut, so you just have to tend them and put them in and install it. Uh, when you get documentation, of course. Um, which I can put one in jazz, I put a couple different other ones in here. So it's, it's a pretty handy little device, really. It's kind of a necessity. You don't start drilling holes in your old retro equipment. Uh. Now, I'll tell you another reason why we did this too, is that I did drill holes in this one, okay? And I did have switches for everything in there. And I've got a couple other SXs at, at the office that I, well, I didn't want to drill. But I remember back in the day when we had drilled a few of these that they work fine until you went from one user group to another, oh. and the metal filings that fell down on oh. your computer <laughs> wow. ended up moving around and shorting wow. something out. So That's you had to good. usually pull the power supply section on the back of that oh. completely if you wanted to drill it, make sure there was no filings oh. in there. That's right. So, yeah, it's bad news. So anyway, so that's what I've been up to for the last year, and I'm going to move forward with cbostuff.com and get stuff with Mike done. So it's going to be a lot of fun actually doing some of that stuff. And that's it. So cool. Thank you, Jim.